Okay, good morning, everyone. If I could ask you to take your seats. Um, I'm Adam Posen, the Peterson Institute for International Economics president, and we're genuinely excited for the highlight of our macro week, and in fact, our whole spring program to have today with us the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister of Canada, Christia Freeland. Um, many of us have been following her work and her leadership for years. Um, I, as the proud son of two people born in Toronto, uh, uh, have a certain soft spot for this to begin with. Um, joking aside, we're fortunate today to have a longtime colleague and friend of, of the minister, who's also a colleague and friend of ours, um, Cecilia Malmstrom. Uh, Cecilia is a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, but we get her here as often as possible. Um, and she, of course, served in a number of capacities, including as the European Commissioner for Trade uh, before coming back to non-political life and analysis. And uh, Cecilia will be moderating today's speech and discussion with the minister. Cecilia, could I ask you to introduce? Thank you very much, uh, Adam, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome here. Welcome to all of you online as well. It gives us enormous pleasure to welcome Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christia Freeland, who is a friend of the Institute and also a personal friend for full disclosure. Um, Christia Freeland has been also Minister for Trade. That's where we met and we negotiated the EU-Canadian agreement together. And you have also been instrumental in updating the um, the NAFTA agreement, UCMSA, but you call it CUSM, I think, the other way around, the new NAFTA. Exactly. In November uh, 2019, Christia was appointed Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and then the, a year later also Minister of Finance, and she's the first woman who has ever been Minister of Finance in Canada, which is an achievement. And she is also a journalist and an author, has written several books. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Christia. You will speak, and then we will have a conversation on stage. So please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mrs. Christia Freeland. Um, you'll notice that for the conversation between me and Cecilia, we're seated because we got along exceedingly well as trade ministers, but there is a little bit of a height differential. So, um, and look, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, Adam, I'm a fan of your intellectual work, and I should have known you had Canadian roots. Like, you're so sensible, clear thinking, reasonable. There's got to be some Canada in there. Um, and uh, you also have excellent judgment because in having uh, Cecilia involved here in the Peterson Institute is wonderful. And it is really a pleasure for me to spend some time again together with Cecilia. Um, it was kind of a miracle that we managed to get CETA done. Getting big trade deals done is hard, uh, to put it mildly. And it was really thanks um, to Cecilia's conviction and deft navigation of the politics of the European Union. Um, Cecilia and I came to call uh, our, each other sisters in trade. And it was really watching Cecilia at work that gave me first um, a real insight into um, the complexity of the EU. You know, in Canada, we think interprovincial federal government relations are hard, and I was intergovernmental affairs minister. But watching all the work that Cecilia had to do at national and subnational levels. Um, made me really admire you, Cecilia, and your brilliance as a politician. And also for all the Europeans here, gave me just tremendous respect um, for how you guys have found this way to work together. Okay, so while Canada stretches nearly 10 million square kilometers from the Pacific to the Arctic to the Atlantic Oceans, there are just 39 million of us, barely a tenth the size of the United States. So 
as the 39th largest country in the world by population, it is not immediately apparent that Canada would boast the 10th largest economy. But Canada has been blessed with an endowment of what the world needs, and far more of it than we could ever require ourselves. Furs for Europe's wealthy became the timber and grain that helped to build and feed an empire. Canada today is the largest exporter of oil to the United States, supplying at least twice as much as Saudi Arabia and Mexico combined. And we sell our airplanes, our AI, and our aluminum to the world. That is why in a country with a healthy political debate on many issues, we have five parties in parliament and our government holds just a minority of seats. We do agree on one thing and that is trade. Canada is massive, but also small. Trade is necessarily central to who we are. Canada is a trading nation, which is why as a political leader, I'm proud to be a member of a team that secured NAFTA for a new generation. And our ambassador to the United States who worked on that deal is here with us. Uh, I'm proud that we delivered trade deals with both the European Union and our partners in the Pacific. And as a Canadian, I am just as proud of the comprehensive cross-party support these agreements enjoy. But as Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, I am also very aware that I arrive in DC at a fraught moment. As the world's economic leaders gather here this week, many of our conversations will be colored by one overarching anxiety. The question of the Inflation Reduction Act and what it means for our trade and economic relationships with this great country. More than 90% of Canadians live within 150 miles of the US border for a reason. Our allies in Europe and Indo-Pacific are farther away, but they would be nearly as hard pressed to imagine an economic future that is not intimately linked with the United States. That's why as the US makes a historic investment in its clean economy, workers and business people and political leaders in the rest of the world from Toronto to Tokyo to Turin are wondering where we fit in. So that's what I wanna talk about this morning, the IRA and what it means from the perspective of a friend, a neighbor, and an unabashed free trader. Let me begin by saying this. The IRA is a historic and transformative piece of legislation, one that will change the world for the better. It is good for the United States, it is good for Canada, and it is good for the world. And to my friends, including people here today, who might bristle at this assertion, here's why I believe that to be true. First, because this is America's path to building a clean economy. The global net zero transition is the most significant transformation since the Industrial Revolution. Depuis 2015, le Canada a investi massivement pour bâtir notre économie propre, notamment avec un investissement sans précédent annoncé dans le budget que j'ai déposé le mois dernier et qui porte notre investissement total à plus de 120 milliards de dollars. Aujourd'hui, 83% de l'électricité canadienne est produite à partir d'énergie propre, ce qui fait de notre réseau l'un des plus propres au monde. Nous comptons le rendre encore plus propre et doubler, voire tripler, la quantité d'électricité que nous produisons. Nos investissements dans les véhicules électriques et leurs chaînes d'approvisionnement dans l'hydrogène et dans le captage d'utilisation et le stockage du carbone. Nous ferons du Canada une fournisseur fiable d'énergie propre et de minéraux critiques pour le monde entier. Depuis 2019, 
nous avons établi un tarif pour la pollution par le carbone. Un tarif qui a survécu à deux élections nationales et dont la légitimité a été confirmée par notre Cour suprême. Notre critication est passée au début de ce mois à 65 dollars la tonne, c'est beaucoup, et l'argent que nous récoltons ainsi retourne directement dans les poches des Canadiens. Les paiements pouvant atteindre 1 500 dollars par année pour une famille. But no matter how seriously Canada takes the climate challenge, and we take it very seriously indeed, or how seriously the United Kingdom or France or Japan takes it, we know we do not stand a chance of building a clean global economy without the United States. Everyone here will remember the sense of dread we felt when the US abandoned its Paris commitments. And thus, we feared our collective chance to leave a livable planet to our children. But with the IRA, the most essential force for climate action is back. And I am very grateful to have America's ingenuity and sheer vast economic capacity alongside us in this existential effort. Second, and perhaps even more important, is the role the IRA will play in rebuilding America's middle class. American working people were battered and beaten during the race to the bottom era of unfettered globalization, particularly in the Great Lakes states that are so deeply interconnected with Canada. Their pain was and is real. None of us should be surprised that pain has threatened to destabilize American democracy itself. The American people are smart and they have a history of rejecting political systems that don't work for them. Indeed, you could say that impulse is at the foundation of America itself. Just as we need the United States to embrace climate action, if our shared efforts are to have any hope of succeeding, we need American democracy to be strong if global democracy is to flourish. The IRA, with its strong labor requirements and a commitment to the hollowed out regions of the United States, is just as surely an investment in the middle class as it is an investment in climate action. And measures like the child care obligations in the CHIPS Act will support working women. In Canada, in 2021, we invested more than $30 billion in a national system of early learning and childcare, with a commitment to bring fees down to just 10% a day by 2025. Already, childcare fees have come down by 50%, and the labor force participation rate for Canadian women in their prime working years has hit a historic high of 85.7%, that's compared to just 77.1% south of our border. At a time when labor shortages are constraining our economy and contributing to inflation, affordable childcare is both making our economy stronger and helping our families thrive. And that is of paramount importance because in Canada and in the United States, and indeed in all of the world's democracies, the first and last and most fundamental measure of the success of our policies is whether they work for working people. You can forget about Paris targets and emissions reductions to say nothing of GDP or geopolitics if you are failing on this most important metric. We all need to build our middle class at home and every single one of us has an interest in a strong American middle class, and therefore in policies like the IRA that support it. As a cabinet minister who regularly crisscrosses my country and a door knocking constituency MP who has been elected four times, I have found that Canadians from ocean to ocean to ocean value the same things. A job that pays them well doing work which is respected. 
the ability to live a dignified and prosperous life, and the confidence that their children's lives will be better than their own. Capitalist democracy succeeds when we can deliver on these essential promises. And it falters when we do not. President Biden's approach of building the economy from the bottom out, up and the middle out is one that Canada most assuredly shares. At its heart, it's an approach shared by our democratic allies around the world. The IRA is about building the prosperity of what Prime Minister Trudeau would call the middle class and those working hard to join it. It is industrial policy and climate policy that works for working people. It's economic policy that will strengthen American democracy at a time when all democracies need a strong America. But just as America's allies have an interest in America's success, I believe that America also has an interest in ours. In his address to Canada's parliament last month, President Biden told us that we are at an inflection point in history. He's right. Taken together, the global fight between democracy and dictatorship and the existential threat of climate change make today the most consequential moment since the Second World War. President Kennedy said that with increased ability comes increased responsibility. And in its ability to address today's challenges to democracy and our planet, the United States is indeed unique among nations. History has proven that in the face of the most difficult missions, the United States can undoubtedly do a very great deal, more than any single country on earth today. But while you can do a lot alone, the scale of today's demands is so great as to overwhelm even your own soul capacity. And what history also shows us is that the United States is able to meet the very greatest of challenges only when working with allies. A strong United States is necessary for the world today, but it is not sufficient. Your allies must be strong too. So while I absolutely understand the value and the power of the IRA as legislation that can help save the planet and shore up American democracy. Let me offer a few cautions, or perhaps polite reminders. I'm Canadian after all. From a friend, from a neighbor, and from someone who truly believes in the United States as a unifying force for good. First of all, we all know that building our clean economies and creating good middle-class jobs will require a lot of capital. So let us be aware of one danger. It will be all too easy for us to get drawn into a race to the bottom to attract it. That's exactly what happened when, in our individual efforts to promote investment and spur economic growth, we drove corporate tax rates down around the world and weakened the domestic tax bases that are essential to investing in the middle class. Les trois décennies qui ont suivi la Deuxième Guerre mondiale ont été une période d'opportunité durant laquelle se réalisait la promesse démocratique du prospérité, du dignité et d'espoir en l'avenir. L'économiste français Jean Forastier a eu raison de surnommer cette période les 30 glorieuses. Les pays de G7 ont connu une croissance moyenne de 3% par année sur toute une génération. Mais au cours des dernières décennies, la croissance s'est ralentie. Dans le même temps, les salaires moyens ont stagné et les inégalités de revenus se sont accrues. Il s'agit là d'une trahison de la promesse du capitalisme démocratique. Nous nous sommes tous enforcés d'inverser cette tendance. Au Canada, depuis 2015, les inégalités de revenus ont diminué d'11 
et le nombre de Canadiens vivant dans la pauvreté a baisé de 5-6 Cet effort soutenu doit obligatoirement s'appuyer sur une base fiscale nationale solide. C'est pourquoi la Cour fiscale a du pilier de l'OCDE, défendu par la secrétaire d'État, la secrétaire de Trésor Yellen, est convenu en 2021 est si important. Et c'est pourquoi le Canada travaille avec enthousiasme à l'entrée en vigueur de ces deux pays. And that is all the more reason not to begin a new mutually sabotaging competition to provide ever richer corporate subsidies. Because just as the corporate tax race to the bottom may have enhanced bottom lines, but impoverished our middle classes. A corporate subsidy war might be good for some shareholders, but it would deplete our national treasuries and weaken the social safety nets that are the foundation of effective democracies. It is in our collective interest, as friends, as partners, and as allies, to work together to ensure that our incentives drive innovation and investment rather than create a vicious beggar thy neighbor spiral. Now, that of course is much easier said than done. And so here I think we could all benefit from the historic experience and current expertise of our allies in the European Union. For decades, Within their union, they have balanced the need to drive industrial investment in their national economies against the danger of corporate subsidy wars. That is what we must try to do today on a broader scale. My second polite reminder would be that free trade, when it is free, when it is fair and therefore truly free, does actually work. The stagnant middle class incomes of recent decades have made many understandably skeptical of the neoliberal formula, formula of free trade and low corporate taxes. Working people in Canada, in the United States, and in democracies around the world have long understood that they draw the short straw in a competition with the voiceless proletariat on the factory floors of authoritarian economies. There is a reason the industrial heartland became the Rust Belt. We should do everything we can to level the playing field for our own working people. Canada's determined commitment to ban goods produced by forced labor from our supply chains is one such example, as are similar measures in the US and the EU. But it would be a huge and historic mistake to react to the abuses of the global trading system by embracing autarky. I said earlier that the effort to build the clean economy of the 21st century is the most significant economic transformation since the Industrial Revolution. And that is true. It is therefore also true that no single country not even the United States, can invent all of the new technologies or possesses all of the natural resources that the net zero global economy requires. Canada fought hard to secure our eventual place in the IRA's EV and battery requirements. We did so because it was essential to the future of the Canadian auto industry, but also because a vehicle and its parts cross the Canada-US border at least seven times before it is fully built. You need us as much as we need you. Our Asian and European allies have made similar arguments, and we are glad that the US has heard them. Our individual economic success will depend on our ability to navigate this transition together, and US leadership will be essential. And where the US embeds by America into its procurement or incentives in support of its bruised middle class, it will be appropriate for America's partners to respond with requirements of our own. 
That is the intention of the reciprocal procurement measures that Canada proposed in our budget last month. At the end of the day, all of us are seeking to build clean economies that protect working people. We should never forget that when done right, free and fair trade can help us do exactly that. And today, there is a further equally pressing challenge we must consider as we craft our economic policies and design our trading relationships. National security and the great struggle between dictatorship and democracy that is being waged in the world today. The global economy was fundamentally changed on February 24th, 2022. In turning his guns on Ukraine, Putin also opened fire on the interconnected global economy so many of us believed would be a shield against war. His marching criminal armies and the hostage taking of European energy supplies clarified a lesson that China had likewise been attempting to teach us for years, that economic security is a matter of urgent national security. Russia controls energy and China controls many critical minerals. Last winter, Europe learned a bitter lesson in the folly of depending so greatly on Russian gas. Yet today, our reliance on Chinese lithium and nickel sulfate is even more exclusive. Beijing, as President von der Leyen said last week, has been working steadily and over decades to make China less dependent on the world and the world more dependent on China. These strategic vulnerabilities to authoritarian economies put our own security in jeopardy. We need to de-risk our economies, which means working more closely together. Where we must be strategically vulnerable, we should choose to be vulnerable to each other, an approach Secretary Yellen has described as friendship. It is here where the United States is and must continue leading the way. The U.S. Defense Production Act funding for the production of Canadian critical minerals, which President Biden announced last month, will make both of our economies more secure. Carving Japan and South Korea into the IRA's clean vehicle provisions will create jobs for Americans and reinforce the economic security of two of our most important partners. An IRA accommodation for Europe can speed up the de-risking of Europe's most essential supply chains while creating new opportunities for workers and businesses on both sides of the Atlantic. And we need to think ahead and have a plan to work together when it comes to economic coercion. Europe rallied admirably this winter when deprived of Russian gas. But long before that, smaller economies, Norway, Australia, my own country, faced economic punishment for displeasing Beijing. The EU's internal initiative on economic coercion a direct response to the bullying of Lithuania is important both as an insurance policy and a deterrent. We should work to adopt a similar measure among a wider group of allies. Finally, we need to remember that the interconnected challenges I've been discussing today, addressing climate change, building our middle class, strengthening our democracy, are by no means the exclusive province of the non-geographic West. Indeed, they are even more acute in the global South. That is why efforts like the Bridgetown Initiative are so important and why our work needs to embrace and invite the widest possible group of partners. The events of the past year have proven true what Prime Minister Trudeau said last month that climate policy is economic policy is security policy. The challenges and opportunities we face today are the most significant in our lifetimes and they are deeply intertwined. Defending democracy on the battlefields of Ukraine 
while deepening its roots in our own countries and the bonds between us all. Rebuilding the middle class while saving our planet and working together to build the clean economies of the 21st century. Clean economies with good jobs that pay well, where our citizens can live dignified and prosperous lives and have the confidence that their children will do even better. Because that is the promise of democracy. If we do it right, if our national efforts to build our clean economies and grow our middle classes are complementary rather than in conflict, we can all deliver on that fundamental promise. So let that be our work as leaders, as intellectuals, as citizens, to build a world where we look after our friends. Because President Biden is right when he says, as he said in the Canadian Parliament last month, that there is nothing we cannot do when we do it together. Thank you very much. It's just a pleasure to. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Christia. Thank you for sharing your vision. Thank you for your strong value-based leadership. Uh, thank you for being so clear and uh, giving advice or reminders to our American uh, friends here. Uh, lots to talk about, lots to discuss. Uh, let's start with the IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act. As a European, it's a bit painful to say IRA because it gives connotation to something quite differently. So we thought it was an odd acronym to choose, but uh, let's look at the content. I think most people here and those who are watching us and all over the world welcome, as you do, the, the strong investment in the fossil price society, in the climate transition, and that commitment that, that is clearly given in the, in, in the Act. But there are concerns. There are concerns about the discriminatory uh, elements that are there, whether they are WTO compatible or not, the local content requirements, and as you also said, the, the risk of subsidies. This is something we, we are looking at, and from a European perspective, we see that this could actually threaten the internal market, and as you say, it threatens also domestically, but also the global uh, system. So, so can, we, can we dwell a little bit uh, on that? How, how do you see that situation? What, what is Canada doing to, to sort of counteract that risk, and how can we work together? Um, okay, excellent question, really, I think, Easy. really the core <laughs> economic challenge of the moment. I want to start by saying something different, but that I wanted to be sure to say today. Um, and that is uh, that Canada, and you know, I personally, as a former journalist, am very, very concerned um, by the arrest of Evan Gershkovich. Um, I really, and I think all people should be, but maybe everyone in this room um, which is a room of ideas and economic ideas and depends on the work of business journalists. Um, when Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor were arbitrarily detained, it was very important for Canada that other countries stood with us. Um, and so I think it is really, really important for all of us um, to call urgently um, for the release of Evan. Um, it's just crossing this incredibly, this line which should be incredibly sacrosanct, um, which is the freedom of journalists to work. So I did Absolutely. want to say that. I feel very strongly about it, and I hope everyone here does too. Um, navigating the challenges you raise, Cecilia. I mean, I do want to start with a point that I think we really can't lose sight of, um, or two points. One is, we really all need America in the game, and we benefit tremendously from America being hugely committed to climate action. And so much uh, of the economic transformation that the IRA is going to drive is gonna help us all. It's gonna create so much innovation and drive down the prices of the technologies we all need and so we need to remember that and, you know, say thank you to the United States um, for this um, really game-changing plan. Um, second thing, 
and I do really want to emphasize this um, with equal strength. And this is maybe something that as a Canadian, we see um, more uh, closely than any other US partner. And that is the absolute importance of the US middle class being reinforced. Um, I was speaking not so long ago with a Canadian company that like very many Canadian companies <laughs> has operations on both sides of the border. They're very, very standard for very, very many Canadian companies. And uh, the CEO of this company said to me, the absentee rate at our US op operations is 25%. And at our Canadian operations, it's around eight or 9%. Um, to me, that figure says so much about how the American middle class, particularly as I said, in the truly great Great Lakes states that we have so much in common with, um, needs to be supported. And I see the IRA as a huge and essential effort to do that. Um, and I think we can't lose sight of how important it is for sure it's important for every single Canadian, but I would say it is important for every single person in every single democracy in the world for US democracy to be strong. That will only happen if the US middle class is strong. And if regular Americans feel like their government set of economic and foreign policies is working for them. So that's kind of my starting point. Um, in terms of what it means for us, um, I would say two things. On the climate side of things, um, you know, we've been at it for a long time. Um, our government was elected in 2015 very much on a climate action mandate. We have a national price on pollution and we maintained that price even last year at a time of high inflation. Um, if I took my uh, jacket off, you would see the scars on my back for having done that, because uh, I'm finance minister. Uh, and we actually increased our price on pollution at the beginning of this month to $65 a ton. Um, that is, I believe, such a powerful and important driver of climate action and it's the best, we think it's the best economic measure to encourage everyone across our economy to adapt. So we have been at the climate, we have been working on climate for a really, really long time. Um, but how do you see the risk of, of a subsidy race where, where companies are, are dragged across the Atlantic or, or across the border uh, because of the IRA. And other countries also massively around the world are investing or, or are, are issuing subsidies. I think, I mean, I think that is definitely a challenge, which is why I, I spoke about it. Um, and I think what we need to do is be thoughtful, work closely together. Um, I'm here for the IMF World Bank meetings, obviously, and we'll be in meetings of the G7 um, finance ministers, among others. And what I, think, what I think our objective needs to be is to recognize incentives for investment in the clean economy, I think are necessary and are a good thing. I think we need to have more investment happen. I think government incentives can crowd in private investment. And Canada now has, uh, my deputy minister, Michael Sabia, is here. We calculated uh, ahead of the budget about 120 billion, uh, about 120 billion dollars together in our climate investment package. It includes tax credits. It includes concessional finance. It's built on our price on pollution, and I think that's the right thing because I think we need more investment to happen more quickly, and we need people to take some risks on some new technologies um, and to do big things they otherwise might not do. For us in Canada, one of our big focuses is on electricity. We think we need to double, maybe triple our electricity production. 
by 2050 to meet our climate targets. It's gonna take a lot of money. It's gonna mean building a lot of infrastructure and government necessarily needs to be there. So our response is, not response, our action is, yeah, everyone I think needs to be investing heavily in climate action. It's not, the industrial transformation won't happen otherwise. But I think we need to be really, really thoughtful uh, to make sure that the investments that different countries around the world are putting in place end up overall having the effect of driving more private capital into this essential space in the economy rather than just diverting it from country to country to country. That's, th that's I, and I think it can be done, but it will only happen if we are thoughtful and careful. And as I said, Cecilia, I should be asking you the question because I do think, no, I, th I think the EU- I put the questions here. <laughs> I think the, the EU is, is a very, we have some real lessons to learn from the EU because the EU actually, I would say more than North America, um, has experience, has a history of understanding the value of industrial policy, the value of encouraging investment in specific sectors. And at the same time, the EU for a long time has been thoughtful about ensuring it's not just uh, a question of the X amount of investment that was gonna happen already, running around from country to country in Europe, chasing the biggest government subsidies. So that's what we have to try to do in a broader group of friends. I agree, but that history is slightly diluting now in Europe because of, of this, of course. And, and the risk is that those with the biggest pockets uh, are the ones who are successful at the expense. Because there is, I mean, globally, there are good subsidies, obviously, and there are bad subsidies, but there's no real definition of, of this. And, and uh, ideally, we should work together on the, on, the, on the green transition. And you mentioned the, um, the mining industry and, and the risk of being so dependent on some minerals from China. And there are these discussions loosely on, on some mineral club or some mineral uh, corporation on this, where supposedly you could do joint investment by the, the in, in the Western world or among allies. And Canada, as, a, as an important mining country, we have huge resources of this. You could, of course, play a very important role there. How, how do you see that? Okay, we are really, really excited about mining. That is not a sentence you hear uttered that often yeah. in Washington. Yeah. Um, but is that in accordance with your green budget? 100%, yeah. Yeah, mining, and we began, with a big investment in our critical mineral strategy in last year's budget of about 3.4 uh, $3 billion dollars. And then in this year's budget, we have further tax credits to encourage uh, clean manufacturing and clean tech, which will be directly supportive of both extraction and processing. Um, I see this as a huge opportunity. I was, um, as part of my aforementioned crisscrossing of Canada, I was uh, in Newfoundland, on Newfoundland and Labrador last week um, at Long Bay uh, at a nickel processing plant, which processes nickel, which is mined at Voices Bay. Um, this is a huge, huge nickel deposit, huge nickel processing capacity. It is the cleanest nickel in the world. You might even know about it, Cecilia, because North Bolt, uh, Sweden's Northvolt has a deal with them because Northvolt is trying to develop the cleanest possible supply chain and Long Harbor Nickel plays an important role. So yeah, I do think um, that we've kind of taken the, our eye off the ball a little bit when it came to mining and critical minerals. And I think in thinking about the clean economy, something maybe we haven't collectively hitherto devoted enough thought to is the clean economy needs to be built out of stuff too. And at the end of the day, that stuff comes out of the earth. It needs to be mined, it needs to be processed. I think there are real opportunities for us, that like Canada is very much investing in our own capacity, including processing, including production. We wanna be players all along the supply chain and very keen to work with our partners. I would actually add uranium uh, as a very important area for us to be focusing on. We certainly are in Canada. Um, 
And I do think, you know, I spoke about the Bridgetown initiative. Um, I think it's going to be very important for us in the building of the clean economy um, to work with the widest possible circle of willing partners. And I see in our work on critical minerals an opportunity to do that. The final thing I'll say, I'll say two final things on critical minerals because I'm very excited about them. We all are in Canada. Um, is, you know, we haven't always done it so right in the past, mining and processing. Um, and there has been a lot of uh, environmental damage done. Um, a lot of the rights, particularly of indigenous people, harmed. Um, we are working hard in Canada to do it differently this time in what I would say is kind of a, a new real moment of growth for the mining sector. Um, very, very important obviously for us to do that at home. I know Sweden has some of the same issues that you're thinking about with your own critical minerals. Um, and I think it's g going to be very important as we work with partners in Latin America, in Africa, to be sure that those environmental standards treatment of or working with indigenous people um, are also really important standards in our work there. Thank you. I, I know you, you are short of time, but, and, and there's so much I wanted to ask you, but, but you mentioned working with a group of friends, and you also alluded to uh, this growing conflicts between democracies, fewer and fewer, and, and, and dictatorships, uh, referring also to Secretary Yellen and, and her thoughts about friend shoring. And I think you have elaborated on this when you spoke across the street uh, a couple of months ago. So, so, and we were both in, in uh, Davos in January, and we heard uh, Dr. Ngozi, the Secretary General of, of WTO, expressing great concerns about this prospect. I mean, who is a friend, who is a foe, and if you're not a foe, are you a half friend? And, and the, what would this mean to all our potential friends and allies in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia? How would you defend this friend shoring or this working with, with allies or friends in order not to exclude potential very good friends and create new cleavages in the world? Well, first of all, I would say, I think it's less of a new idea than it may seem to be. Um, we have different closeness of relationships, really, with every country in the world. Um, and that very much includes the economic relationship. And you will remember, Cecilia, you know, one, I would say the core thing that made it possible for Canada to conclude our trade deal with the EU was our shared values. That was kind of what got it over the line, was that we agreed that we had shared commitments to labor standards, shared commitments to environmental standards, and that was going to make it possible for us to open our economies very fully to one another. Um, so I think that's what we've always done, and I think there's a good reason for it. Um, what I think has changed um, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine is I think we collectively have come to realize that where we believed that mutual economic dependence was actually going to be a protection against conflict, um, it might actually create a vulnerability in the event of conflict. Um, you know, I mentioned Evan um, Gershowitz because um, I um, uh, had a similar time in my life to the work he's doing. Um, I was a reporter in Ukraine and in Russia, and Siddharth Tiwari uh, and I, who is here in the audience, spent a lot of time talking about the Russian economy together in Moscow. Um, and I remember in that time there was so much excitement about the opening up of the former Soviet Union, particularly Russia, and a real belief, which it was sincere, it came from such a good place that we would build these ties and it would make it impossible for us to fight with each other. Um, and I think Tom Friedman captured that notion actually brilliantly with this golden arches theory of conflict. No two countries that both have a McDonald's can go to war with each other. That was how he encapsulated this idea. And what a compelling argument and how beautiful, right? Like, instead of fighting with each other, we'll get more prosperous together. Um, 
And I really believe that our belief, certainly Canada's belief, the belief of Europe, the belief of the US, that it was gonna work like that was 100% sincere. And I think it was worth trying. Um, but I think what we have found um, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine is, and I, I'm not sure the Yeltsin guys, I think the Yeltsin guys kind of agreed with us and they were trying to do the same thing. Um, but I think subsequently, uh, the Kremlin dis decided that actually they could turn that paradigm upside down. And in fact, that these increasingly close economic relationships, rather than preventing a conflict, would prevent us from responding in the event of a conflict. And there's actually quite a lot of you know, open source public writing by Russian economists, security experts, people, people supportive of the war, sort of saying, wow, you know, we thought that by getting the Europeans to buy so much of our gas and be so dependent on it, they would never be able to do anything if we invaded Ukraine. That was like an explicit consideration. There, I mean, to any Europeans who are here and to you, Cecilia, well done, guys. Like, I think Europe's response has been remarkable. And I'm grateful to have you guys as our allies and on our team. I'm very glad Sweden is gonna join NATO. Um, if only. Yeah. But, but, you know, it will, it will, it's gonna happen. But the point here being, um, this is at this point not, um, it's not an abstract argument anymore. Um, you know, we don't need to have Jesuitical debates on will closer trade prevent war or not. With Russia, it didn't. And we also know the Russians actually organized these relationships with a strategic purpose explicitly in mind. Um, and I think the same is true of China's economic policy. And again, no kind of, nothing, um, no secret sources are necessary. Um, I think that it's worth believing people when they say things in public. Um, and it is worth believing how they describe their economic policy and its purpose. And so I think it does make sense for us um, to make ourselves less vulnerable, to de-risk our supply chains. And again, here I think maybe the perspective of um, a smaller economy Number 10 is not too bad, considering there's 39 million of us. I think it's pretty good. Um, but we're not the US and we're not the EU. And any country that is a smaller economy in the world today knows what it's like to navigate the global economic space with the threat of Chinese economic coercion hanging over you. And I think that's not okay. And we need to collectively um, be, not be naive about that, be aware of that, and think about ways um, that we will make each one of us independently, but also us collectively less vulnerable. And my final point I'll say to Ngozi is I do think that um, we need to be very mindful of the global south, um, of countries, uh, we, need to, we need to really bear in mind that this notion of trusted partnerships should be about trust. It shouldn't be about wealth. I know you need to go. There are lots we could talk about, but uh, your meeting. I'm sorry. It's it's a G G I don't want to be all, all showy-offy, but it's the G7 finance ministers, meeting, ministers who are meeting at noon. So I apologize for that. We want you in G7, so be a strong voice in G7 and in the rest of the world. Christian Freeland, thank you so much for joining us.